today, as we celebrate Palm Sunday and lead into Easter, I want to ask you, who is Jesus? If you met someone on the street who asked that very question today, how would you respond? Now, I can almost hear your inner groaning, like, oh, come on, Ladine, are we going to be that basic today? And being here in church, I assume that we all have some sort of understanding about who Jesus is. But I do wonder how each of us would answer that question. Do you think you'd respond in a historic or maybe academic perspective? He's the son of God. He's the central figure of Christianity. He's the Messiah. Or would you give a more personal account? He's my saviour. He's my redeemer. He's my king. It struck me how Linda prayed for us a couple of weeks ago. During her prayer, she claimed Jesus as our mediator, as our might and strength, as our hope, our provision, our peace and our sustainer. Is that the Jesus you know? And is your response sure? Or do you think it would change depending upon who the audience was? Who is Jesus? It's a fundamental question, right? One that we, we need to reflect on, upon at some point in our lives, regardless of who we are or where we live or whatever other circumstance we might find ourselves in. We each need to consider and respond to God's calling on our lives. This is the main theme of the Gospels, which is where we find ourselves today in the book of Matthew. All through the Gospel accounts, from the time of his birth, leading up to his death and ultimately his resurrection, Jesus directs us to reflect upon our response to that very question. Who do they say I am? Who do you say I am? And I think it's crucial to consider our response because the depth of our relationship with Christ impacts the depth of our devotion to him. I want to say that again. Because the depth of our relationship with Christ impacts the depth of our devotion to him. Risk-taking devotion hinges on our trust in Jesus. So as we unpack the word together today, I want to acknowledge this day, Palm Sunday, by drawing parallels between the events taking place in Jerusalem as Jesus enters the city riding on the donkey and in the days that immediately follow with those that we're faced with in our present day. My prayer is that through this study, we might be spurred on to a deeper understanding of who Jesus is and be, and be encouraged to come to know and rely on him more intimately. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may your spirit minister to us as we unpack your word today. Unsettle us, Lord, so that we might be spurred on from a place of comfortable complacency to one of deep devotion and dependency on you. Deepen our relationship with Jesus Unveil our eyes, unveil our hearts, unveil our minds as we seek to know him more and more. Change us, Lord, make us new. In his name we pray. Amen. Now, it would be great if you've got your Bible handy this morning or your phone or something. We're going to jump around a little bit. Um, so if you've got your Bible or your phone handy, don't be shy, get it out. We're going to start in a moment in Matthew chapter 21. Now, our Matt has been teaching us about the importance of understanding setting when we read the Bible. And so I want to first begin by setting the scene. 
Jerusalem and all of Judea is under Roman rule, governed by Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. Jerusalem is the holy city of Israel. This was the festive season of Passover. The old city is filled with pilgrims and visitors and travellers who have come to celebrate Passover feast. Secular historical records indicate that there were about two and a half million people in Jerusalem at this time. Two and a half million people. That's hard, hard to fathom, isn't it? It's like bright at Easter. The roads are packed and there's people everywhere. The Jewish people are waiting for the prophesied Messiah, their foretold saviour. They're expecting maybe a political leader or a warrior who will free them from Roman dominion. And rumours are rife. Jesus is coming. His, behind him are his sermons and his parables and his miracles. Could this be him? Now, because the city is full, many stay in the outlying areas. People from different regions all seem to have a special place where they met and camped. The south end of the Mount of Olives had for years been the camping grounds and the meeting place of the people of Galilee. These were unsophisticated and unspoiled people, common people, and it's where we find Jesus. Jesus had spent the night at the home of friends, Mary, Martha and Lazarus, in Bethany, and he's now come up to Bethphage, and up until now he's travelled mostly around regional areas, but his ministry is reaching a climax it's time to bring his message to the heart of the Israelite nation, to Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They bought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from trees and sp spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, careful and deliberate connections are made with Old Testament prophecy, acting as a bridge linking Jesus with the Saviour foretold throughout Jewish history. This passage is no different. Jesus' purpose in riding into Jerusalem was to ultimately make public his claim that he indeed is that Messiah, the King of Israel, in fulfilment of Old Testament prophecy. Matthew says that the king coming on the fall of a donkey was the exact fulfilment of Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus rides into Zion, his capital city, Jerusalem, as a conquering king and is hailed by the people as such in the manner of the day. The timing is no accident. 
all of Israel is gathered at Jerusalem. Huge crowds see him proclaiming his mission, which is unmistakable. This was a very purposeful, very public proclamation of who he was. The people went wild. They were sure that their liberation was at hand. The crowd acclaims Jesus with words from Psalm 118, Psalms associated with Passover. Hosanna, they cry. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The garments that were laid down also signal Jesus' royalty, as well as the branches that recall also Psalm 118 with bows in hand. The crowd rightly hails Jesus as the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. Last week we heard as Matt outlined that genealogy. Yet Jesus is more than that. He's more than a prophet. He's the redeemer who would indeed save his people but not in the way that they're expecting. His perspective is eternal. He came as a king to save mankind from sin, not to save the Israelites from the Romans. As Jesus enters Jerusalem, there are details that we need to take notice of that symbolise these fundamental differences of perspective. The outward display of, and worship of Jesus acknowledges him as king, but his kingship is different to that of the world. A king marching to war, as the people were expecting, would display power and dominance. He would arrive in grandeur on a horse. Jesus is not that king. The donkey, not just that, but a colt of a donkey, so young a foal that it still relies on its mother, is significantly symbolic. Entering the city on a donkey symbolises arriving in peace. This is an act of humility rather than one of pride. The problem is that while Jesus is the Messiah, the prophesied king, he doesn't come to meet the expectations of Jewish people. They miss truly seeing him. They miss truly knowing him. They miss truly experiencing him. Matthew's purpose in writing his, his gospel is to convince devote and dedicated first century Palestinian Jews that Jesus is in fact the promised Messiah of God. These are God's people with generation upon generation of teaching and blessing and acts of provision and leading of redemption and loving mercy and yet caught up in their own perceptions, limited by their own capacity of their own understanding, they miss truly understanding Jesus. It makes me wonder, how are we the church of believers missing Jesus today? How does our limited capacity and understanding, our preconceived notions and expectations hinder us from fully knowing our Redeemer and Lord? In Luke's Gospel account we read, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. 
Luke tells us that Jesus wept over Jerusalem as he entered the city. Whilst his disciples who follow him sing praises to him, no longer having to keep quiet, the Pharisees rebuke him. Look what Jesus says, If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. How might Jesus weep over his people, the church, today? Do you think that he could make that same statement? If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace. So what, on what has become known as Palm Sunday, we see Jesus enter the royal city. The streets of Jerusalem are open to him. No longer does he tell his disciples to be quiet, but to shout his praises and worship him openly. Jesus was openly declaring that he was their king, the Messiah that they had been waiting for. And then what, is, what does he do next? On Monday, like a king, he ascends to his palace. Not a temporal palace, but a spiritual one. He goes to the temple for his is a spiritual kingdom. Look at Matthew 21, verse 12. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables and the money charges and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read... From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Jesus enters the temple and what does he find there? Merchants and money chargers set up in their booths, crowding Gentiles and others out from worshipping God. He found those selling sacrificial animals at high prices, taking advantage of those who had travelled long distances. This was God's house, his dwelling place, a place which was meant for prayer and purpose. Instead, Jesus finds the religious people placing up barriers to frustrate the worship of others. Here they have opportunity to meet Jesus, to know Jesus, to learn from him. And yet their hearts are cold and they're closed to him. They're more interested in the running around and the noise making of the kids who see Jesus for who he is and worship him. The, The blind and the lame who have been excluded are also welcomed in and healed by Jesus. Despite their years of experience, their knowledge of the scriptures, the prophetic stories of Jesus' coming, those in the temple are indignant. Their king has arrived. And how do they respond? In anger and annoyance. How are we similar today? How much do we take coming to church for granted? How easy it is to be the indignant churchgoer. How often are we distracted by the choice of song rather than have our minds and hearts fixed on the outpouring of praise? How readily can we become critical of the presentation of the preacher that we miss being humbly challenged and changed by God's living word? How easy it is to speak up when a child takes an extra bicky at morning tea but remains silent about worldly atrocities. If Jesus were to walk into our church this morning, 
what would he drive out? Now, I've always found the following verses confusing. I feel a bit bad for the fig tree. (laughs) Let's look at what it says. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back into the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but he found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately, the tree withered. What I've learned is that the curse of the fig tree is symbolic. These verses link explicitly with those that came before in the temple. In the Old Testament, the fig tree often stood as a symbol for the nation of Israel. You can see that in Jeremiah or or Hosea. The tree which produces no fruit is good for nothing but destruction. It represents the temple, which for all its ritual is spiritually barren. Cursing the fig trees, Jesus' way of saying that the whole nation of Israel had become spiritually barren before the Lord. They had the form of religion, but not the reality. They knew the right words to say, but their hearts were far from God. They were not living out their faith. There was certainly no risk-taking devotion. Pretty powerful, isn't it? Jesus is concerned with the fruitfulness of our heart. Are we open and humble to his teaching and leading or proud and closed, unteachable and therefore barren? Tuesday, Jesus returns to the temple In verse 23, Jesus entered the temple courts and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. These questions are wrapped up in the revelation of who Jesus is. The religious leaders are pridefully stubborn and unyielding. They're self-righteous. They're motivated by a desire to cling to their own established authority rather than to accept Jesus. They don't want to be challenged or changed. I can't help but make comparisons to our own Western culture. How much do people struggle with any form or of authority? How much is anything and everything being accepted and esteemed because you can't ask a question of anyone anymore? How much have people grown defensive and angry and unyielding and self-serving? In response, Jesus unleashes a series series of parabolic teachings. It's important to remember that these are some of his final public teachings. Jesus tells the parable of two sons. The son who said he would obey and then didn't represents the nation of Israel. They said they wanted to do God's will. They were set apart for it, but they constantly disobeyed. They were superficial. The son who said he wouldn't obey and then did represents the Gentiles, those who were lost but found salvation in Jesus. The parable of the wicked tenants follows. Verse 33. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard 
He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, they killed another and stoned a third. Then he sent out other servants to him, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read this in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in your eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. This parable tells of the suffering past prophets and ultimately the rejection and the suffering of Christ himself. The chief priests and Pharisees know Jesus is talking about them. He knows about their plot to kill him. And despite this clear message of this parable, they continue in their plight. They are so totally consumed, lost in their deceit. Their religion is so self-serving. Lastly, Jesus tells a parable of the wedding feast. We're not going to look at that in depth this morning, but it, it signifies that there's an open invitation to salvation, but it requires a response. An Israelite is only an Israelite if they embody being an Israelite. We must acknowledge Jesus as king and be ready and willing to respond to his calling. Now have a little look at what comes next. If you've got your Bible or your phone, scan through the rest of chapter 22. We see the Pharisees trying to catch Jesus out by questioning him about taxes and marriage and the law. The exact date of that day is 10 Nisan. This is how the Jews calculated their calendar year, based upon Exodus in chapter 12, the time of the Passover. This was the time that the Israelites were to choose their sacrificial lamb. Jesus is presenting himself as that lamb. On that day, the Israelites were supposed to vet the lamb. Now, the word vet means to make careful and critical examination of. The challenge of Jesus' authority from chapter 21, verse 23 to the questions about paying taxes, about the resurrection, about the greatest commandment in, 20, in chapter 22, show the Pharisees vetting Jesus. They're looking for faults. They're looking for imperfections. Finally, Jesus launches into a scathing attack on Israel's legalistic religious leaders. Jesus, who has continuously shown his mercy and patience with so many ordinary sinful people, could not tolerate the self-righteous pride he saw in the Pharisees and scribes. Do as they say, he tells the crowd in, cha um, in chapter 23, verse 3, but not as they do. 
In his final public teachings, Jesus outlines a series of seven woes or denunciations aimed at the religionists, those who claim on God with their words but whose life betrays him. These are a series of woes have actually been mirrored up against the eight Beatitudes that were part of Jesus' first public teachings at the Sermon on the Mount of Olives. Oh, sorry, at the Sermon of the Mount. Let's have a closer look at each one. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. God's heart grieves over those who keeps their heart of others from him. Jesus accuses the religious leaders of shutting up the kingdom of heaven, not going in themselves, but keeping others from entering too. These, the people of God were supposed to be the beacon of light to the rest of the world. Instead, they're full of pride, putting heavy burdens on people. In contrast, in the Beatitude, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are humble rather than rich in spirit, who have a dependency on God. The propagation, the, the sharing of a faith based in religion ch tells you to do and it keeps you from a faith that says done. Think about Jesus' statement on the cross. He doesn't say, I am finished. What does he say? It is finished. The cross says done. Jesus wasn't focused on himself. He was doing the work of God as these spiritual leaders should have been doing. We don't work for salvation. We work from salvation. Verse 15. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. This is radical language. It's offensive. Jesus accuses the religious leaders of taking advantage of the weak and disoriented, of manipulating others. False religion exploits those who are exposed, whereas true religion covers the, the afflicted. In James 1.27, we read, Religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Real religion is about charity and integrity. In comparison, when Jesus spoke on the Sermon on the Mount, he, he blessed those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Coming from a, a place of mourning is the opposite. It shows complete dependency of God. Those who mourn cry out to God in desperation. And those who have experienced the comfort that God offers are more able to share it with others, which is completely the opposite of taking advantage of them. Jesus accuses the religious leaders of being zealots, of making showy gestures about converting others that aren't pure. Instead of having a genuine desire to bring people to God, their aim is to add people to their club, to their way of doing things. Jesus loves passion, but zeal without the harness of the Holy Spirit is legalism that produces a checklist. Think of Saul's conversion to Paul. As Saul, he was all about upholding legalism that resulted in religious terrorism. But rewired through experiencing the Holy Spirit, he went from religion to relationship. Half the New Testament is evidence of his conversion, of what is achievable when you have passion that is harnessed by the Holy Spirit. By comparison, Jesus claimed, blessed are the meek, 
for they will inherit the earth. Remember that meek means strength under control. It's understanding our brokenness and reliance on God, realizing our need for Jesus and being open to be equipped for him, for, by him for his glory. Verse 16, woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by the oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound to that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Here Jesus is accusing the Pharisees of making the things of God about semantics, playing around with the meaning of words rather than focusing on acts of devotion. True religion is hungering and thirsting for righteousness, his righteousness. Verse 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy and faithfulness. You should practice the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Now Jesus is using humorous hyperbole to say how ludicrous their actions are. He's saying that they're majoring on the minor. They're so legalistic about tithing that they're carefully measuring out a tenth of each seed and herb and leaf of their dill and their, and their mint and their cumin. Can you imagine separa separating out each one? But they're completely blind for the purpose of tithing, of seeking justice and being merciful. In Matthew 9.13, we see Jesus tell the Pharisees, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. Jesus ministers to those who are honest about their sin, those who are open to be ministered to, those who are spiritually bankrupt, who know their dependency is on him. It's about relationship, not religion. Jesus says, I want you to know me. And by comparison, blessed are those who are merciful. Do our lives act out mercy and compassion rather than judgment? Verse 25, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. In Matthew 15, the Pharisees had rebuked Jesus because his disciples had eaten bread without first cleaning their hands. And Jesus had responded to them, saying, the Pharisees were people who honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. He explained that what defiles a person isn't what goes into their mouth, but what comes out of it because it shows their heart. Jesus is solely focused on our heart. In contrast, he said, blessed is the pure of heart, for they will see God. They see God's purpose at work in their lives. They trust God in all circumstances. A pure heart sees God in comparison to the blind Pharisee who sees only the, and, and sees and only values the exterior. 
how easy it is to make comparisons of this with the world today. The next woe seems quite similar. Verse 27, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and an everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. In Jesus' time, people would have whitewashed the the tombs during feasts like Passover, painting the exterior white to look beautiful on the outside, dressing up the city. Jesus compares the Pharisees to those whitewashed tombs, looking grand on the outside but being dead spiritually. He claims they are a spiritual contaminant, seeking to bring people into false religion based on hypocrisy and wickedness. We cannot earn our own redemption. It's Jesus alone who can purify our hearts. He said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. They know the peace of the Lord and they introduce others to the Prince of Peace. How this resonates with our society today. How much are we caught up on exterior, prioritizing image while our insides remain broken and spiritually dead? Finally, Jesus claims, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of blood of prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I tell you, all this will come on, your, on this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wow. It's hard to read these verses and not be moved by the power of their condemning message. The Pharisees have been claiming that if they had lived in the days of their forefathers, they wouldn't have killed the prophets that they would have been wiser in recognising their teachings. Jesus tells them that not only have they been blind and responsible for all the suffering of all the prophets from A to Z, from Abel to Zechariah, the irony is that Jesus stands before them, the prophesied Messiah, and they don't recognise him. At this very moment, they are plotting to kill the Son of God. In contrast, Jesus claims, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Ultimately, it is Jesus that demonstrates this righteousness through his death and resurrection, which leads us to Easter. Friday is coming. The Gospel of Matthew emphasises the fulfilment of Scripture. It 
reveals Jesus' radical teaching. It determines how the way we view Jesus' identity shapes our own. God wants our lives to overflow with love and compassion and mercy, the marks of his kingdom. He wants us to know Jesus. He wants us to follow his calling. A Jesus follower is only a Jesus follower if they embody being a Jesus follower. We have a choice in how we respond to the unsettling realities of our times. Do we act in fear and withdraw? Do we put up prideful barriers and seek to serve ourselves? Or do we follow Jesus as King with risk-taking devotion, responding to the greatest needs of our day with love and peace and hope? The story of Jesus' triumphal entry is one of contrasts. And these contrasts contain applications to us today. It's the story of a king who came as a lowly servant on a donkey, not a prancing steed, not in royal robes, but on the clothes of the poor and humble. Jesus comes not to conquer by force, as earthly kings do, but by love and grace and mercy. His sacrifice is given for all people. The only thing that can keep you from Christ is you. His is not a kingdom of armies and splendour, but of humble servitude. He conquers not nations, but hearts and minds. His message is one of peace with God, not worldly contentment. If Jesus has made a triumphal entry into our hearts, he reigns there in peace and love. And as his followers, we are called to exhibit those same qualities so the world sees the true and living King reigning in us as the next week unfolds and we come together again to celebrate Easter to contemplate Jesus' death and resurrection I wonder if you're open to meditate on who is reigning your heart if Jesus stood before you now what might he say to you are you open to surrender your life to him Do you want to live a life of risk-taking devotion? Are there parts of your heart that are closed or fearful or proud? How might we collectively, bright Church of Christ, offer love and mercy? How How might we invite others to know Jesus too? How might we be the church that God has intended I've been following a devotion about Lent over the last couple of weeks. It's titled, A Journey to Hope in Uncertain Times. Lent is traditionally a time about fasting, about considering what we hunger after, what drives and satisfies our appetites. Through this devotion, I've been challenged to consider how I might be a witness for the way of Jesus in the world how I might resonate his hope and his peace. When we know Jesus as our Redeemer, when we devote ourselves to him and join in his kingdom work, our lives bring fullness and tangible evidence of him. During the devotion, I was encouraged to posture myself towards Jesus and I found the practice really grounding I'd like to share it with you. The first is a posture of surrender. This is saying it's not about us. It's positioning ourselves to resist the temptation to seek what we want and instead 
would surrender to the larger, greater purposes of God, saying, you can have every part of us today, Lord. The second is a posture of generosity. We keep our hands open. We're going to stop the performing. We're going to stop the proving. We're going to stop the spectacular look at us. Stop the people pleasing. We want to be open instead to the free gift of God in us. The free gift that is Jesus. The free gift that flows from the heart of God. We keep our hands open in generosity that says, whatever we have so freely received, we will freely give. And the final posture is a posture of mission where we open ourselves up to the other. That might be the deepest needs of the world or it might be people near us, people we've been resisting. But we want to take all the power that we have in Christ and instead of using it for ourselves, we use it for others like Jesus did. If you're willing, I'd like to close by standing together and closing our eyes for a time of prayer based upon these postures. I believe that it's not by chance that we're all here this morning. God is at work in our hearts individually and collectively. From the babes that we've just dedicated to him, to those who have come and been journeying with him over decades. We belong here. And he's saying to you today, who do you say I am? He wants us to know him, to be in an ever deepening relationship with him. And so I invite you this morning to offer yourself to him afresh. Please stand.